capturing uh, Emerald over here. Um, I wanted to ask you uh, two, two questions. Two I need questions. to watch for her hands. One on, one on the shootout that you just described and the other one on Ukraine. On, on the incident that happened in the past hour, I wanted to know, is there any line of communication that you can describe that has been ongoing over the course of the past two weeks on the diplomatic side of things? I know that the defense secretary says that his, con his a call to his counterpart was not returned from China. But on the diplomatic side of things, are there lines of communication between the U.S. and China right now? Well, certainly, look, we have, a, we have a, an embassy in Beijing. Diplomatic uh, uh, discussions routinely happen with, with Beijing. So, of course, the diplomatic channels remain open, sadly. Uh, the military ones uh, uh, do not appear to be open right now. Secretary Austin made a good faith effort to reach out to his counterpart and, um, and, uh, and was rebuffed. And, and that's unfortunate, particularly when uh, at, times, at times like this, you want to keep as, uh, as open as you can the lines of communication. And the president's committed to that. And then on Ukraine, uh, President Zelensky was in the UK earlier this week, and he received a promise from the UK government that the UK would train Ukrainian pilots on uh, NATO standard uh, jet fighters. Uh, can you tell me if you think that's a good idea? Is that something that the U.S. is considering in terms of training Ukrainian pilots on NATO aircraft as well? Well, if they're going to get Western aircraft, uh, then they're going to need to be trained on them. Does that mean that will happen? They'll get Western aircraft? Uh, I, that would be up to the nations that, uh, that may be willing to provide aircraft. Um, I, I'll go, I've said it before. Probably tired of me hearing about it, hearing me say it, but uh, these are all sovereign decisions. And uh, if a if a NATO nation or even a non-NATO nation wants to provide capabilities like fighter aircraft to Ukraine, that's certainly their decision to make. Uh, and one would assume uh, that if you're going to introduce a system into a def into a military that they have no experience with, that there's going to have to be some training that goes along with that. We're doing it right now, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. We've got Ukrainian soldiers uh, learning how to use a, a Patriot battery. Um, and um, outside of Ukraine, we're, we're helping train them on uh, combined arms maneuver. So it's not unusual to do that if an advanced capability is provided, but that's going to be a national decision. Thank you, Admiral. Um, thank you, Corinne. Isn't there a concern that these objects, that the object and the balloon, were both discovered when they're already flying over U.S. airspace? Should they be detected before they enter the U.S.? I think we're going to continue to learn a lot about um, how uh, how these things are uh, or can be detected in a better way. You heard the NORTHCOM commander talk about um, certain gaps that he felt he had in his domain awareness. So from this incident last week, we will learn, we'll certainly learn about the capabilities of that surveillance asset, but we're, we're also, we also expect to learn more about our own processes and our own systems for detection and tracking. Um, uh, I, I, I don't want to get into exactly how this one was detected, but um, uh, I can assure you that, uh, that we're going to continue to try to improve our own knowledge base with respect to these systems. Um, can you say anything about the proximity of it and its flight path to the sensitive oil fields near Prudhoe Bay? And was there any threat at all at any point to, to that equipment in that region of Alaska? I'd refer you to the Pentagon for more detail about the track. Again, this just all happened within the last hour, so I don't know what the proximity was to, to, to oil fields. And your second question was? Oh, it's just about the sensitivity, you know, the oil fields, basically. Well, again, I mean, we just don't know what this object was. We don't, uh, it, it'd be difficult for me to point to a threat or a, a specific concern, such as oil fields, when we don't really understand what this object uh, was doing. Okay. And, and then I just have one more quick question on the Russian, completely different topic. Uh, the Russians have said they're going to cut oil out output now. Um, what is the U.S. response to that, and will you reach out to OPEC to ask them to sort of compensate the difference so that the price of oil doesn't escalate at a time when you're just starting to see inflation? Or Once inflation? again, Mr. Putin's willing to weaponize energy, um, and uh, the, this uh, uh, this move, if it proves to be true, uh, it doesn't come as a big surprise uh, as a reaction to the to the price cap. Um, and it just shows you the lengths of which he's willing to, to, to use resources like energy as a, again, as a weapon. What the United States will do, 
have done, continue to do, is work with allies and partners to make sure we can better balance supply and demand uh, uh, and, and try to meet that need. It's important. We still believe that Mr. Putin not be allowed to profiteer uh, in an inappropriate way off of the oil he puts on the market so that he can then fund his, his military in the field. Right, Jenny,